Во время майских торжеств 1945 года Сталин спросил Рокоссовского, вы не разучились ездить на коне? Конечно, нет, ответил Рокоссовский. Вот и хорошо. Вам придется командовать парадом победы. Принимать парад будет Жуков. На параде победы Жуков и Рокоссовский были на коне. В прямом и переносном смысле. Вскоре после триумфального события на Красной площади Жуков возглавит советскую военную администрацию в Германии, Рокоссовский – северную группу войск в Польше. Видеться они будут редко. Близкая их встреча состоится 14 мая 1955 года на церемонии подписания Варшавского договора. Ночью после церемонии министры обороны СССР и Польши уединились в служебном кабинете Рокоссовского. Как донесла потом охрана, всю ночь из кабинета доносились то громкие споры, то хохот. Вышли они под утро и, по словам очевидцев, обнявшись. Теперь они кажутся полубогами, эти маршалы Победы. А ведь они люди, просто люди. Both marshals of the victory, Rokossovsky and Zhukov, who were the same age, were born in December. Zhukov on the 1st, Rokossovsky on the 21st. The Russian winter forged unbeatable ones. Rokossovsky's ancestors were Polish noblemen. He spoke and thought in Russian, but with a Polish accent. He volunteered to go to the First World War in a Dragoon regiment. After serving only a week during the first trip, he ran into a German infantry outpost. He slaughtered an enemy cavalryman under rifle fire and managed to warn his people about the ambush, for which he was awarded the Medal of St. George IV. In the spring of 1918, the 5th Kargopol Regiment, where non-commissioned officer Rokossovsky served, was disbanded. His cousin, Franz Rokossovsky, who served with Konstantin, departed to newly independent Poland. As for Constantine, he stayed in the country for which he fought and continued to fight, now at the Civil War's front. By August 1920, 24-year-old Constantine was already serving as a regimental commander, while Zhukov served on the Black Sea coast only as a platoon leader. Rokossovsky received two orders of the Red Banner during the Civil War. They met in September 1924 at the Advanced Training Course for Command Staff at the Higher Cavalry School in Leningrad. Like Zhukov, Rokossovsky didn't have an academic military education. Courses, campaigns, and war, these are their so-called universities. In 1937, Rokossovsky came under suspicion. First, he was dismissed from his position as a corps commander then, he was expelled from the Communist Party for negligence. He was called to Leningrad and arrested right on the train. Later, he admitted that he was beaten first by two and then by three men. He held on, knowing that if he confessed, he would die. Three of his ribs were broken, several of his teeth were knocked out, and the scar above his eyebrow from being hit with a wooden stool remained for life. Execution was simulated. They took him out into the yard and opened fire over his head. During the interrogations, he did not say anything, discrediting himself or his military comrades. Not a word. He spent 30 months in prison. By that time, Zhukov, who was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union, was busy with Rokossovsky. Whether it helped him or simply strengthened his resilience during interrogations, he came out fully rehabilitated. At 4 a.m. on June 22nd, Rokossovsky received a directive from the general staff to bring the corps he commanded to a state of full alert. 
despite the overwhelming superiority of the enemy in tanks and air force. In the first months of the war, the troops under the command of Rokossovsky wore the enemy out with intensive defense, retreating only by orders. And so, another war, the most horrific war in the history of the country and the whole world, broke out in Rokossovsky's lifetime. Ivan Bagramyan, then chief of operations of the Southwestern Front headquarters, recalled, the third day of the war was coming to an end. The alarming situation on the Southwestern Front started to prevail. Lutsk was in imminent danger. And when we were racking our brains at the front headquarters, trying to figure out how to rescue the Lutz group, the advance parties of the 9th Mechanized Corps arrived there, commanded by Rokossovsky. Reading his report, we literally could not believe our eyes. How did Konstantin Konstantinovich manage to do that? After all, his so-called motorized division could only travel on foot. It turns out that a determined and proactive commander on the first day of the war at his own risk, took all the vehicles from the district reserve, put the infantry in them, and moved ahead of the corps in a combined march. The approach of his military units to Lutsk saved the situation. From there, Rokossovsky was urgently transferred to remedy the situation near Smolensk. When he asked Front Commander Marshal Timoshenko where his army group was, Timoshenko led Rokossovsky to the highway where they saw jaded and battered troops, tankers without tanks, scattered platoons, a lonely cannon dragged by tortured horses. Here is your army, said Timoshenko. And after all, Rokossovsky did assemble a battle-worthy unit and reassigned the scattered parts to himself in the shortest possible time. He arrived with a handful of officers and two anti-aircraft quadruple machine guns. 20 days later, he had an army on the defensive on a 31-mile front. In September 1941, Rokossovsky was promoted to Lieutenant General and received the Fourth Order of the Red Banner. Then the gravest battles near Vyazma began and the Soviet troops withdrew. Marshal of Artillery Vasily Kazakov recalled, during the first months of the war, the word encirclement was used very often. It was disgusting, a word of panic rather than a military term. But when we were almost completely surrounded by the enemy near Vyazma, I never heard of any officer or soldier saying the word encirclement. The convoys were completely calm. I'm deeply convinced that this is to the credit of Rukasovsky, who did not lose his presence of mind in the most challenging circumstances and always remained unflustered and surprisingly cool-headed. Being obviously a rigorous boss, he was never rude to his subordinates and did not resort to swearing. His ability to discipline a troublemaker without degrading his human dignity was particularly striking. Honestly speaking, Zhukov was many times rougher. Но мы его понимали, конечно, что обстановка сложная, нервы у него несколько расшатаны были. Поэтому я думаю, Светов, что если командующий позволяет себе таких, э, в таких тонах говорить с командующим армией, то уж, наверное, верховный вам командующий поддаст такого жару, что тошно будет. When the Germans were driven back from Moscow, the front commanders ordered Rokossovsky to occupy an important strategic center, Suhinichi. Organizing the military actions and realizing that he had neither the strength nor the means for conducting an extensive offensive operation, he made an unexpected decision to strike consistently at one or another strong points of the enemy's defense. Having only a third of the forces of the enemy, his troops successfully completed the task under the harsh conditions of winter. Немцы выдохнулись окончательно. Части Красной Армии перешли в рассчитанную контратаку, перешли в наступление. Разбили остатки немецких войск. Сейчас немцы позорно бегут. 
In March 1942, Rokossovsky was seriously wounded. He survived a difficult operation. According to the doctor who treated him, the hospital received repeated calls from Stalin, who was asking about the health of Konstantin Konstantinovich. They claimed that it was by the order of the leader that Rokossovsky's wife and daughter were brought from the evacuation, and the general's family was immediately provided with an apartment on Gorky Street. Ariadna, the 17-year-old daughter of Rokossovsky, at that time entered the school for scouts of the partisan movement's central headquarters and constantly went to the draft board with a request to send her to the front. Those were the children of Soviet military commanders, or, as they say nowadays, of Soviet noblemen. After graduating, Ariadna began working as a radio operator in the mobile radio center of the partisan movement's central headquarters. In 1942, Rokossovsky was appointed as a commander of the Donsk Front near Stalingrad. He flew there together with Zhukov on a Lisunov Li-2 without a gunship escort. Zhukov said, the pilot is experienced. Even if the Messerschmitts try to catch us, we will get away from them. Ah, what a goal the Germans had. The two greatest military leaders of their time in the same little plane, unaccompanied, on the eve of one of the greatest military operations in the history of mankind. On December 30th, 1942, the three armies of the Stalingrad Front were transferred to the command of Rokossovsky, who was entrusted with destroying the Paulus Group, and it was done. When Field Marshal Paulus was captured, one of his interrogations was conducted by the front commander. It was not even an interrogation, but rather a conversation between the winner and the defeated. Paulus handed Rokossovsky his personal firearm. This is how the sword was given in ancient times. A fascinating fact, after the Battle of Stalingrad, Stalin will begin to call Rokossovsky by his name and patronymic. The only other person Stalin addressed in this way was the Deputy People's Commissar of Defense, Boris Mikhailovich Shaposhnikov. That's it. Rokossovsky had been waiting a long time to command a huge military operation, and finally the chance appeared on the Belarusian front. It was there that the Germans amassed a force of 1.2 million soldiers. This is what Konstantin Konstantinovich recalled. The plan of attack was conclusively worked out by the Stavka High Command on May 22nd and 23rd. Our considerations on the left wing of the front offensive in the direction of Ljubljana were approved, but the decision about two strikes on the right wing was criticized. The Supreme Commander-in-Chief and his deputies insisted on leading one main attack from the bridgehead on the Dnepr near Rogachova. I was asked twice to go into the next room to consider the Stavka strategy, and each time I had to defend my decision with renewed vigor. After Stalin saw how insistent I was, he approved the plan of operation as we presented it. On June 29, 1944, Rokossovsky was awarded the military rank of Marshal. It happened next to the place where the Tsar's Dragoon fought the German Uhlans 30 years before. When the Soviet troops entered Polish Lublin, there was a huge rally. The floor was given to Marshal of the Red Army, Konstantin Rokossovsky, and he, to the great surprise of all those who gathered there, suddenly spoke in Polish, in good Polish. The crowd howled with excitement. Rokossovsky's last operation in the war was a successful offensive in Pomerania. After the capitulation of the Nazi army, already in the days of May in Berlin, by the Brandenburg Gate, Field Marshal Montgomery awarded Zhukov and Rokossovsky the British orders of knighthood, specifically them. After the war, Stalin sent Rokossovsky as Minister of National Defense to Poland. But it was during the war that the ordinary Polish people greeted Rokossovsky with delight. 
From now on, he was a Soviet stranger for the local political and military elites. In post-war Poland, Konstantin Konstantinovich was attacked twice. A few times when Rokosowski attended the formation of Polish units, people shouted from the ranks, take the Red Marshal away. Rokosowski, go back to your Russia. Well, what can we say? Not a word. Keep silent. Stalin died in 1953. Frontline marshals were carrying Stalin's orders at the funeral, but Zhukov and Rokosovsky were not among them. They became the best commanders of the most terrible world war, but quickly lost their powers in the political intricacies. In 1956, Rokosovsky retired. He left Poland with one single suitcase. He didn't save up anything during the seven years of service there, as well as during his entire previous service. From the stories of Rokosowski's grandson, he had an extraordinary smile. When something didn't work out, he could turn to me and say with a childish, disconcertingly shy smile, well, brother, you see, your grandfather has failed. And only now I understand how difficult it was to carry this smile through his whole life, barracks, wars, and arrests. Unlike Rokosovsky, Zhukov rarely smiles in newsreels. He was a hard and practical man. Here is what Konstantin Konstantinovich himself recalled about him. In my opinion, Georgi Konstantinovich Zhukov remains a man of strong will and determination, richly endowed with all the qualities which are necessary for a major military commander. Georgi Konstantinovich Zhukov was born in the Strelkovka village of Kaluga province in a peasant family. In 1914, he was a young master furrier. He would have remained a furrier, actually. Others will ask, why did Zhukov take the side of the Soviet government? That's why. People did not make it from furriers to marshals under the previous government, shoe salesmen. There's one problem. Zhukov had a gift from God. He was a genius at military skills. He had been in the Red Army since 1918, and in 1920, he graduated from the Rizan Cavalry Courses together with Rokosovsky. He fought on the Eastern, Western, and Southern fronts. In 1923, 26-year-old Georgi Zhukov became a regimental commander. From July 1939 to April 1940, Zhukov was the commander of the first army group of Soviet troops in Mongolia. In August 1939, he conducted a successful operation to encircle and defeat a group of Japanese troops led by General Komatsubara on the Halkin Gol River. In the battles on Khalkin Gol, Zhukov, for the first time, widely used tank units to encircle the enemy. The defeat of the Japanese in the Battle of Khalkin Gol was one of the key factors that forced this country to desist from the plans to attack the USSR along with Germany. For this operation, Corps Commander Zhukov was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union and the Order of the Red Banner of the Mongolian People's Republic. In 1940, Georgi Zhukov was promoted to the military rank of Army General. Between January and July of 1941, Zhukov was the chief of the general staff, deputy people's commissar of defense of the USSR. His foresight in July 1941 is striking. When Hitler had just began to plot turning the two armies to the south with the intention to attack the flank of our southwestern front, it seemed unlikely that the German command could stop what looked like a successful attack on Moscow, even when the German command itself did not quite know yet exactly how to act. Zhukov decisively reported to Stalin that
that the enemy would send some of the forces from Moscow to Kiev and proposed measures to strengthen the Central Front and withdraw troops of the Southwestern Front outside the Dnieper. Stalin did not accept this and, moreover, removed Zhukov from the post of Chief of the General Staff for excessive persistence and harshness. And yet, here we have a clear example of what is called insight. Zhukov will have plenty of them during the war. In August and September of 1941, Georgi Konstantinovich commands the reserve front troops and conducts the Yelninsky operation, which became the first major offensive success for the Red Army in the Patriotic War. Armored and mechanized formations with the support of air force and artillery were used to confront operational challenges. Throughout the war, Zhukov was driven from place to place. As they would say nowadays, he was a crisis manager. Three days after the end of the operation at Yelnya, Zhukov will take command of the Leningrad front where a disastrous situation has developed. Zhukov will stabilize the front in three weeks, preventing the fall of Leningrad. In mid-October 1941, Moscow was already under serious threat. On October 12th, our troops left Kaluga, Kalinenfeld on the 14th, Mozhaisk on October 18th. After the German breakthrough in the section of the 30th Army of the Kalinin Front, panic broke out in the capital. Stalin called Zhukov and asked, are you sure that we will hold Moscow? I'm asking you this with a heavy heart. Answer honestly, like a communist. Georgi Konstantinovich replied, we will most certainly hold Moscow, but we need no less than two more armies and at least 200 tanks. The capital was not only defended, but on December 5th, the Red Army itself took the counteroffensive. Already in November 1942, Zhukov was busy developing a strategy for the Battle of Stalingrad and the second Rzhev Sichevsky operation. He took responsibility for planning blunders that he would never have made himself. Zhukov was awarded the medals for the defense of Leningrad and for the defense of Stalingrad in 1942. The decree was issued on the same day, December 12, 1942. That's how it happened. He defended two cities that were located several thousand kilometers apart from each other. In 1944, under the general guidance of Zhukov, the Praskurov Chernovitsky and Belarusian offensive operations began. In the latter, Georgi Konstantinovich is already serving as a representative of the Stavka. Zhukov met the new year of 1945 at the front. The Vistula Oder operation is obviously a masterpiece of generalship. Zhukov's troops went all the way through Poland and captured the bridgeheads on the Oder in two weeks. The Wehrmacht did not have such a pace in 1939. Berlin was 60 kilometers away. Using powerful searchlights that blinded the enemy, on April 16th, before dawn, the attack on Berlin began. By the 2nd of May, parts of the 1st Belarusian Front, together with the 1st Ukrainian Front, had captured Berlin. On the 8th of May, 1945, Zhukov accepted the unconditional surrender of Germany on behalf of the Supreme Commander of the Red Army. Zhukov is the only military leader in the country to be awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union four times. In addition, he received all the highest military awards of the United States, Great Britain, France, Poland, Czechoslovakia, 
Yugoslavia, China, and Egypt. Throughout the war, Zhukov was the first and only deputy commander-in-chief of Joseph Stalin. And now, let's move on to something unfair, or rather ridiculous. A while back, an American newspaper published a list of the top 100 military commanders in world history. There were only four Russians, including the Soviets, while there are 17 Americans, 19 British, 12 French, and nine Germans. Hitler is in the 14th place on this list. His beaten generals go after him. Zhukov, who literally and figuratively strangled almost all of these strategists and tacticians, ranks 70th. Rokossovsky is not on the list at all. Surely there is no Supreme Commander-in-Chief Stalin either. It's not even clear who won that war. The most terrible world war in the history of mankind. Who commanded the parade in Moscow in 1945? and who hosted it. <laughs>